Not too long ago, I went to give a lecture to the Military Officers Association of America, and uh, the man got up to introduce me, and he couldn't remember my name. So he, he said, would what's his name please stand up? Oh, so now I write these long three-page intros, and nobody wants to read about that. We're not here to hear about, about my great accomplishments in the world of advertising. Uh, and they don't even, nothing matters anymore. After 9-11, really nothing matters much in my past at all. Because after 9-11, I was in shock for about 10 years and finally came out of it. Uh, not deep shock, I mean, I functioned, I ran a business, uh, personal development, leadership training, but uh, I was subdued. I really was subdued. And finally, one morning, I woke up and they said, write a book. Write a book. So I went and took a course on how to write a book, which you don't really need to do. Just start writing the book. But I took a course and I submitted a paper and the woman who was grading the paper said, you are a good storyteller. And as soon as she said that, I said, that's it. I'll write the book, I'll finish the book, and I'll publish the book. I published the book, now what do I do with the book? Well, I gotta sell some books to pay myself back. So what do I do to do that? Well, I develop a PowerPoint presentation and some lecture notes, and I go on the road speaking to groups all up and down the West Coast where I live in Palm Desert, California. I was in the Army, I tried to get into the Navy. How many here are military? And how many are Navy? Okay, well here's what happened. I was at Yale and I decided to get in the ROTC, or my father decided because he wanted the 16 bucks a month or whatever they paid us. <laughs> so I tried to get in the Navy and I failed because of my eyesight. So I tried to get in the Air Force and I failed because of my eyesight. But the Army took me. They gave me a special waiver for poor eyesight. Now I can hardly see without my glasses. Special waiver. I couldn't understand why would they give me a special waiver. Well, it was the Korean War. And they needed second lieutenants. And what else do you think they needed? They needed forward observers. I said, oh my God, suppose I'm on the observation post and I get shot in the face and my glasses break. I wouldn't be able to see and call in the fire. Thought it was kind of ridiculous, but that's the way they are. They would make exceptions under those kinds of circumstances. Now this is the eight bells. I expected to hear eight bells. Who's got the bell? You got the bell? Nobody's got the bell, so we'll go ahead. So I'm here today to present to you my history of 9-11, as described in my new book on a clear day, 9-11, an eyewitness account. I'm the only eyewitness I know. I don't know where they all went, but I'm the first one who's written a book and a book that became the history what started as the story of my fortuitous and timely escape from what was basically a sneak attack on our homeland by a bunch of terrorist thugs grew into an abbreviated but authentic history of what happened that day, validated by David McCullough. Have you heard of David McCullough? Yeah, well, he's a very well-known historian and author and a friend of mine. Uh, and then he said this is a truly remarkable historical document. I didn't know that I'd written a historical document. My research in the subject was extensive. I wanted to know not only how and why 9-11 happened, but who was responsible, because afterwards, I wanted to call them up. I wanted to say who, point the finger, point the blame. Who was responsible? How did it happen and why it happened? Who was responsible in allowing our country to be so vulnerable to an attack of terrorists flying our own planes residing in the United States, having resided in the United States for three years, being trained to fly transcontinental jets, becoming licensed by our own flight schools. I couldn't understand it. Well, I still don't. To some, I found out one thing I learned in my life is to, for some questions, there are no answers. You just have to accept life on life's terms. Since the CIA, FBI, and other intelligence services had certain knowledge of an impending attack on high towers in the major cities, why didn't they take measures to prevent it? Interestingly enough, on the morning of 9-11 at 9.35, Donald Rumsfeld, who was the Secretary of Defense, was giving a talk to his staff men in the Pentagon. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell you that someday there will be an attack on our cities by terrorists 
and they'll be going after high towers in our major cities and 15 minutes later the first plane hit the North Tower. Pearl Harbor, well, in a historical sense, unlike Pearl Harbor, 9-11 was certainly unique if you can imagine being attacked by our own domestic terrorist organization called Al-Qaeda representing not one country but many Islamic nations. Nations. They all had Saudi passports. Why did the 19 terrorists have Saudi passports? Because we were friendly with Saudi Arabia and they knew that and they figured it'd be easier for them to get in than if they had a passport from Iran or Iraq or anywhere else over there in the, in the eastern countries. Now we have ISIS, perhaps even greater threat. This was the beginning of what Rutgers Law Review, quoted in my book, describes as a new kind of war. 9-11 was a manifestation of what was to come as we face an enemy who wants to kill us all regardless of age, sex, or religion. The devastation to our civilization and psyches was unimaginable. So much so that it took me 10 years to recover from the symptoms of post-traumatic shock. I realized that I was in a unique position to bring 9-11 back into sharp focus. And so I tackled writing the book in the perspective of my experience as an authentic witness. But then I had to get out and tell my story, and that's why I'm here today. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad I'm here today. But for about a minute and a half that morning on 9-11, I would not be here today. Now, I have some facts and figures that I think are kind of interesting, and you may remember some of them, but I'll just highlight them before I get into my story, okay? 2,819 people died that day in the towers of the Pentagon in the fields of Pennsylvania. More deaths from 9-11 than Union soldiers killed at Gettysburg. The attack was over in one hour and 15 minutes, making it the shortest military conflict, air conflict, in military history. One hour and 15 minutes and the, sh the show was over. 20% of Americans knew someone who was killed or damaged in the attack. How many of you know somebody who was killed in the attack? It's the largest exodus of humans in the history by water, including Dunkirk in World War II. Do you know about the amazing boat lift of 500,000 people off the shores of Manhattan that day? I'll talk about it, and I'll tell you where you can get more information on it. 500,000 people. Dunkirk, there was something like 288,000. The largest elevator catastrophe in history, with 200 or more frightened souls burning to death because they couldn't release the new locks that had been installed three weeks ago in the elevators. Firefighters and paramedics lost 30%, 30% of the rescue team. This was an unusual tragedy for the 343 fighters who, because of faulty communications, didn't get the word didn't get the word from their commander to abandon the building now because their radios were on a wrong frequency. The fires burned on ground zero for 99 days. 99 days? That's a long time, isn't it? Only 20 people escaped as the towers began their fall. The South Tower, where I was, was hit 16 minutes after the North Tower, but was the first to fall. Both towers fell to the ground in less than 10 seconds. I heard them fall. I was five blocks away. But, miracle of miracles, there were 4,400 planes in the air that day. It was a beautiful day in New York, 84 degrees. 4,400 planes in the air. They got them down to safety without mishap in less than an hour. Think of that, 4,400 planes. Over 422,000 New Yorkers suffered later from PTSD. I'm one of them, at a minor case. <coughs> Illness from toxic and dust exposure numbered 18,000. The largest gold heist in history, over $300 billion of gold was stolen from the basement of the South Tower. Nobody knows how or when. <coughs> How'd they get them out? Who knows? It's one of those questions that's unanswerable. 20% or more of the scrap steel also disappeared, although much was sold to China and India. China got it at bargain prices. It was also used in the bow of the USS New York, in the Mars Land Rovers, 
and a U.S. Parks to commemorate 9-11. Well, that's kind of a, a backdrop of, of what uh, I'm going to be talking about. And now it's time for the main event. So here we have... Oh, I arrived the night before. I arrived uh, on the night of the 10th. I stayed at a hotel five blocks away. Normally would stay at the Marriott, which of course was one of the buildings that was destroyed. Five blocks away. Uh, and I was there to give a lecture on how to invent your future. I may have mentioned that. So here are the towers. Where did it go? There it is. Came back. Would you know? Here we are. Now listen, this thing jumps around a lot, but I want you to know it's not because I've been drinking. <laughs> and it's, it's not going on. Am I aiming the right way? There we are. Well, anyway, this is the North Tower, and this is the South Tower, and this is where I was on the 78th floor. They're both about 1,300 feet tall, 50,000 population. Now why doesn't it do that? Well, we won't play with it anymore. This is where I had dinner the night before, Windows on the World, and I got very friendly with the Mater D, and she died the next morning, and I have a recording of her last words begging the police to come and save her. <coughs> That's the complex in the center. Huge. Each of those buildings, by the way, each floor was about an acre. So this is something like 14,000 acres around this place. It was a huge. And does the collision course of the planes. You can see the north, the north one here. This was the one that hit at 8.46 a.m. And this is the one where I was which hit at 9.03.01. I kind of remember these numbers. Now, this shows you the towers. There are five, basically five of them, there's seven of them, but five, they went down very fast. Uh, the seventh tower didn't go down until 5 p.m., but there's a special reason for that. And the ones in the red are buildings nearby that were so badly damaged they had to be blown up. They had to be destroyed. Uh, the ones in kind of the murky uh, yellow all needed uh, major structural repair. And all the ones, the other ones, these around here, all this area, there was damage in the apartments and a lot of it was asbestos damage. Hundred and thirty four countries had people in those towers who died. This is the gang leader. And uh, he's a bad guy. And he was the one who directed the planes that day and trained the pilots and trained what they called the muscle men. And the muscle men are the ones who had box cutters. One of them got his hands on a pistol. One of the terrorists in his in his apartment, he had a big apartment built a, 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 a mock-up of the flight deck of a 757 with doors and everything so they could practice getting out of their seats and time getting out of their seats and going up to take over the plane. These were smart people. They were well trained. They'd been in training for three years. The plane had been in development for five years. Five years. They were in no hurry. He was having breakfast in Boston at the airport at about the time that I was having breakfast in the hotel in New York. Now, these are the bad guys. Really bad guys. <clears throat> I call this the smallest weapon of mass destruction in the world. It's a box cutter. Three weeks ago I was going from Palm Springs to San Francisco to give a lecture at the Yacht Club up there. And I didn't realize it, but I had two box cutters in my carry-on luggage. They didn't catch them. They didn't catch them. And I didn't know it. I didn't know I had them until, of course, I got there. And I didn't think about it twice. And coming back from San Francisco, they caught them. They, they confiscated them. They asked me if I wanted to mail them home. I said, no, I, I don't want to. Now, isn't that interesting that one of the security systems couldn't pick them up, but another one could? 
These are the flight paths of the planes. You can see where number one was here, Boston. That's the first plane that hit the North Tower at 8, at, uh, yeah, 8.46 a.m. And here's the second one that came around south, flew over the, the Sandpoint nuclear facility, by the way, and into my, into my tower. Now, I don't talk much about, about Pennsylvania. I don't talk much about the Pentagon because uh, I'm not an expert on anything, by the way, but, but I know what was going on in New York in those towers. So you see where the turns were being made? Do you know why they turned to the left and came back around or turned? That's when the terrorists took over control of the planes with box cutters. That's the lobby that I went into, got a badge, went upstairs, express elevator, 78th floor, nonstop, then back down. So I got upstairs about 8.45 that morning, having walked over on a beautiful clear day. Got upstairs, said hello to everybody. I was there to give this my lecture on how to invent your future and reinvent your life. It was the growth, growth metal thing, and it works. So I got upstairs, said hello at 8.45. Then about eight, at exactly 8.46, I heard this boom. I thought, oh my goodness, what is that? The boss, the leader said, the guy who employed me said, what the hell was that? I never heard him use any swear word. What the hell is that? I said, I don't know, but I'll find out. Now, why I was the one who was going to find out, I don't know, because I'm a guest and I'm a lecturer there. But that's just my natural instinct. I teach leadership. <laughs> so that was, I guess, my example of my leadership. So I went down the hall. I'd been in a bombing attack before in 1973 in the Mobile Oil Building. And I went down the hall. I didn't see any damage. Of that. And just that moment, just, just almost consistent with a bang, the building shook. My building trembled. Hackles went up on the back of my neck. My heart stopped beating, I'm sure of it. And I felt the air pressure change. What had happened was an impact, and we didn't know it, of the first plane hitting the, the impact, the shock waves went down under the street and back up our building. And that's what it was. I said to myself, uh-oh. This is a big one. This is the big one. This may be the beginning of the nuclear war. If not, it's the beginning of World War III, which in effect it was the beginning of a World War III, a different kind of war. Uh, I didn't know what to do, and I froze. Then I got into action. Went back to the conference room, and what was a clear day? I looked outside, there was not longer a clear day. It was all gray with stuff shooting by. I thought it was confetti. Somebody pointed out, you don't drop confetti from the 78th floor upside. It doesn't go sideways, it goes down. I said, oh my God, got to get out of here. So I said, okay, follow me. It was my seminar, uh, the manager was there and he said, yeah, come on, let's go. Well, I didn't know where going was because it was the first time I'd been in that building on the 78th floor. I knew it was an express elevator I'd, I'd taken. And this woman named Carol came along and said, come on, I know how to get out of here. So we went. We headed towards the exits. Now the elevators in these buildings are very near the stairway. Now uh, in 1973, in the attack on the mobile building, I had to go down 39 flights of stairs and it took an hour. And this little voice that told me to get out also told me, you don't have time. You don't have that time. Get out now, take the elevator. Well, right above the elevator, there's a sign that says what? Case of emergency, do not take the elevator, take the stairs. And you know what I said? No way, Jose. Those are not my exact words. <laughs> Just take the elevator. And about that time, I came over the loudspeaker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not our building that was hit. It was the North Tower that was hit. Now, we didn't know what being hit was. It could have been a missile, a plane, whatever was hit. It is all right to go back to your offices as far as we know. Some people took that as a directive to go back to their offices. The three of our people stayed in the conference room and within two or three minutes, they were, they were gone. They were vaporized upon the impact of the plane. So the elevator doors finally opened. Now, 
Just get on the elevator, right? Very simple. We'll walk on the elevator. I'm used to doing that. Not that simple. Elevator holds 55 people. There may have been two, three, four hundred people trying to get into that elevator, pushing and shoving and elbowing. So I had to push and shove and elbow. That's not my style. And this woman I was with, Carol, she was very tiny. And I had to almost carry her onto the elevator. We got on the elevator and we got halfway into the elevator. And it got so crowded, and I'm saying to myself, my God, I'm going to die in here. I'm going to get crushed to death. So the people in back of me pushed us forward. We pushed the people in front of them, of us, and people in front of us pushed people out. And I still have nightmares about that. I, was, I, I feel badly about that, that I was one of the people that helped cause other people to get pushed out of the elevator. Of course, if they'd gotten on, we wouldn't have gone anywhere. The elevator door is closed, and I can still hear them screaming, help me, save me. Don't leave without me. You can imagine how you would, might feel. The elevator didn't go right away, and a few moments later it did go down. I held my breath. Everybody else in the elevator must have held their breath. 78 seconds it was down. They go down a floor a second. Got down to the first floor. I started out towards the door where I had come in, and the, and the security guard down there said, no, you can't go that way. You have to go this way. Well, uh, this way was the North Tower. And I didn't know there was a bridge to safety, but I thought he was heading me back to the North Tower. And I'd just been told that it was the North Tower that was hit. So I said, no way, Jose. Those weren't my exact words. And we argued a bit, and I took off with Carol. We went out the front door, and there were people now coming from the North Tower that had been hit at 8.46. Now it's 9.03, 9.02 and a half, 9.02. Here we go out the door, the mobs of people, throngs of people, smoke in the air, fire coming from the North Tower. Uh, disaster, pandemonium in the streets, screaming and yelling and pushing and shoving. Just at that moment, bang, another crash. As I look up, I saw where we had been hit, right where we had been standing less than two or three minutes before. And that's why I said earlier, except for about a minute and a half, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today. So we started running. We started running for it. And uh, I want to show you a couple of more slides here. That's the plane hit my building, and that's where I was. Now notice it's coming in at an angle. That's because it came out of came out of a turn. It was banking when it went into the turn down over the nuclear facility. It came in this way, so in effect, it hit more floors when it impacted than the first plane, which hit at a higher level. I looked up, and that's what I saw. Now that's my imagination and that's an artist's conception because it couldn't possibly have seen buildings both looked like they had just been hit. But okay, I'm trying to make a point here. That's what it looked like when I looked out, I thought it did. And I could hear people screaming. I could hear the jumpers. And the ash and the soot and the debris flying off the buildings and on the street was very dangerous. Very dangerous and now we go into really fast running. Here's a 78-year-old man out running 40-year-old boys, you know, and, and I really was moving, and so was she. All of a sudden, this big guy comes along, must have been a center for the nets, and he knocked her over, knocked her down. Now, I have another decision to make. First one was, do I stay or go from the building? The second was, you know, which way, way do I go? Third one was, do I take the elevator or do I take the stairs? Fourth one, do I stop and pick her up? And the inclination was, no, I don't stop and pick her up. I'm going to get killed if I stop and pick her up. I stopped and picked her up. She was bloodied and bruised and thankful for her, were thankful. And her name was Carol, was Carol in the book, but that's not her real name. She didn't want me to use her real name. She wanted nothing to do with me or the book or the whole day at all. So she, she's been in shock and she's been in post-traumatic stress, yet she's still a very successful sales lady. Well, now we're running for the East River because we're gonna jump in the river to save ourselves. Now, at this point, I figured it probably wasn't a nuclear attack. We didn't know what it was. We knew it was planes and not missile, at least not hit, hit in my building. The noise is indescribable, I'm telling you. How many of you have been in service and been in war? You've heard a lot of loud noises, right? This was unlike anything I ever heard in the field artillery. But not me, but it could have been but it would have been after the building started to fall. But that's an idea of what was going on. Here are these people panicking. We ended up back at the hotel. We were gonna jump in the East River. 
Well, now we're exhausted, so we go into the hotel. So what do I do when I get in the hotel? The first thing I do is go put out the burners underneath the chafing dishes in case of a fire. Now here we are in possibly the World War III or a nuclear attack, and I'm blowing out the fires under the chafing dishes in a hotel. <laughs> Didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Then I go into the kitchen, and I locate the fire extinguisher. I asked them, where's the fire extinguisher? Nobody knew where the fire extinguisher was. What are you going to do with a fire extinguisher in a nuclear attack? I don't know, but I want to know. I've, I've heard you should do these things. And so we finally found the fire extinguisher, and I put somebody in charge of the fire extinguisher. Then the hotel management saw what I was doing and taking over there, the, the kitchen and the dining room. And the people in the kitchen, they were still in shock. They thought I was the new manager. <laughs> so the manager came over and asked me if I wouldn't mind closing the bar. Oh, I said, I wouldn't mind at all. I'd be happy to close the bar for you. So I went over to the bar, and there are three Australians nursing their foster's ale. Now, have you ever tried to separate an Australian from their foster's ale, it is a challenging job. But finally they left. Then I had to cap the bottles. I couldn't find all the caps to the bottles. I was a little nervous at the time. So here I'm tearing off saran wrap, putting over the bottles in a nuclear attack or whatever, whatever it was. Nothing I did was making sense, but it was all had, a, had its own purpose. And I went upstairs and I soaked the towel in the bathtub. I turned off the air conditioner so nothing would come in. Meanwhile, people were coming through the revolving uh, doors. And as they came in the revolving doors, all smoke, ash, and soot came in with them and started to, to gradually rise in the hotel and got up to the 15th floor where I was. So back down I go and I decide I'll, I'll be Mr. Mercy or Dr. Mercy and help them. And so I set up a little table with dampened towels so people could see themselves. And one of the ladies wiped her face off, and it was, she was a black lady. I said, oh my God, you're black. Now, there's nothing about race in here. Oh my God, you're black. And she looked up at me and said, why not? And that broke the ice. We both just laughed and laughed and laughed. So I, I was helping these people. I was also trying to get in touch with my wife, who was still in California, where we were house sitting on the beach in Bodega Bay. Bodega Bay. Anyway, the story goes on. I go to the chef and I say, listen, we got 50 people in here who are hungry. Now in New York, you may know that they depend upon the trucks coming in over the bridges or the, in the tunnels to provide the food every morning because the refrigeration capacity is limited. So we don't have food. So I said to the chef, how are we going to feed these people? He said, that's easy. I said, what do you mean that's easy? How are you going to get food in here? Oh, he said, we order out Chinese. <laughs> Would you believe, about an hour later, Chinese show up with trays of food. Now, the streets are blocked, the barricades are up, the police are out, the ambulance are in the streets, there's cop cars, emergency vehicles, how did they get there? And I finally realized that what I'd always believed was truth. You've noticed that most of the Chinese restaurant menus are very similar, and the names of general Sao or General, whoever it is, is on there. And if you've noticed carefully, you look into the kitchens in the, in the Chinese restaurant, they all look alike. Oh, I said, that's a fantasy I had. There is a master Chinese chicken, or kitchen, under the streets of New York. And they service all the Chinese restaurants in New York. And furthermore, they have their own secret subway system. <laughs> now, I think I was beginning to lose it a little bit. Uh, so we ate and there was more, more going on. It's in the book. It's all in the book. I mean, details are all in the book. But 3 o'clock comes, turn the water off in the hotel. The water is off everywhere to feed water into what is no longer the World Trade Center. It is now ground zero. What is now the pile, because it was changed its name, now it's the pile of all smoldering beams and burning concrete and burning everything else. Uh, they needed the water and they needed, now at 4.30, they needed the electricity. They needed the electricity because they needed to turn the lights on because it was dark now, it's soot and ash and everything. So they told us in the hotel they were going to have to shut down the electricity. They couldn't guarantee our safety. So I took off. I grabbed anything I could from my room to carry. I don't even remember what I took. I took off and I was headed for the subway. If you know New York at all, or even if you don't, it's across town to the east side of town. I wanted to get on the Lexington Avenue coming north to a hotel where I'd stayed at many, many times. Now it's so dark, I don't know where I am. I got lost. It took me three hours to get about 15 minutes. 
what was normally take 15 minutes. And on the way, I was stopped uh, by a member of the SWAT team who told me I couldn't go east, I had to go south. I told him I didn't want to go south, I had to go east. I'm an old man, I'm crippled and I have a heart problem, which was all a lie, I was old. And he said, listen buddy, I don't have time for all this, just go the way I tell you to go. I said, yes sir. He was fully armed. So I said, yes sir. I went south, about five minutes later, three very tall men, boys, 17, 18, 19, 20, showed up, blocked my way, told them my story. They said, oh, you're a hero. We'd like to get your autograph. I said, well, I'd be delighted to give you my autograph. But I left my pens pen back in the hotel room. I had to leave in a hurry. A silence. And then a couple of seconds later, they said, oh, by the way, do you have any money on you? I said, oh, I didn't know what to say. I said, well, I'm sorry I left my wallet back in the hotel room. I was in such a hurry to get out. And then they started closing in on me. And just then, the SWAT team shows up. Scared them off, said they weren't boys from Brooklyn. They're notorious thieves and thugs from a gang on the south side of New York. And they were out to rob you, rape you, murder you, or whatever, and get your money. So I was saved again. I'm saved again. Somebody's looking after me, I'll tell you that. I finally got on the subway and I said, oh boy, I'm safe. Well, I really didn't feel safe. I was the only one on the subway and it was the last subway. The doors closed just as I got on it. I'm the last person except the conductor. And every time that subway stopped, it was not an express. Every time it stopped, I was terrified that these thugs were following. And that they, now here comes the paranoia. And they were going to get on and they were going to, they were going to torture me and take my money. So it was not a comfortable subway ride. Then I get up to the hotel. I had called the hotel from the room to make a reservation. And they said they'd have a room for me, but they said, call us back. Now how am I going to call them back? If I'm running through the streets of New York terrified, I didn't have a cell phone. I mean, this was in 2000, you know, this was 2001. I didn't have anybody to call them back. So I got to the hotel and I was covered with soot and ashes. They didn't recognize me. I'd stayed there almost every three or four times a month. They didn't recognize me. Oh, Mr. Mr. Upson. So we couldn't hold your room for you because you didn't call back. Oh, I said, gosh. So I started to leave the hotel. And they said, however, we talked to Mrs. Helmsley. She owned the hotel. And the reason I stayed there was she gave us all a 30% discount, senior citizens. That's why I stayed there. She said she wants to give you a room free of charge for the night. We're going to give you the suite. So that was very nice. I went up, freshened up in the room now. This time it's almost 9 o'clock at night. Though I go next door to my favorite restaurant, the Chai Am, Chinese American, to have dinner. And uh, that was another nice thing because the maitre d' said we usually close at 9 o'clock, but for you, Mr. Upson, we'll stay open as long as you need us. So, ha, oh, I really felt good about that. I really felt good about that. And the story goes on, and the next morning I woke up, my brother came over. I hadn't seen him for <coughs> 10 years. He couldn't believe it, and he was grateful. And he offered to give me some money. And he always does. <laughs> the older brothers do. So I didn't take it, you know, my pride got in the way, and then I realized, you know, I can use it, so I said, I'll take it. So he gave me $500, which I did pay back, and uh, we, we embraced, and he left, and then I went to the library, and I did a lot of research. I went out, and I got the, the mission statements for the CIA, the FBI, the Defense Department, the Office of Management, the budget I got for the president thing, and I got all the, I got all their, all the information because I wanted to find out who was responsible for not making the decision or having the information that could have stopped this from happening. I finally took several years for it to filter in and for me to finally figure out what, what I think really, what really went wrong. I don't have time to talk about that right now, but if it comes up in the Q&A, that would, that would be fine. So then I was picked up the next morning by limousine sent by the manager, the owner of the company that I was working for, I was consulting to, and, uh, they, and he, he, uh, they were having a service a memorial service for the two men, three men that had died two days before. And the state of New Jersey uh, waived the law, the law which says you have to have a death certificate to have a burial or to have a, to have a final service. They waived that, that law. So anyway, I stayed and that night I was taken to a hotel in, in New Jersey where I was doing another s series of seminars the next day. And people said, how could you possibly have done that? 
I said, I don't know. I said, just the spirit moved me. I wasn't going to not live up to my obligation and responsibility for my clients because of somebody 10,000 miles away who was trying to kill me. I'm not going to do that. So I stayed and I went back to, uh, to California and met with my wife. And um, we, all, we had a lovely home. We were house sitting on the, on the, on the beach. And um, every morning I got up around 7 or 8 o'clock have breakfast and I go downstairs in the fire, play, fire and sit in the chair and fall asleep. That was not my pattern. I'm a morning person. And so that was, should have been symptomatic. There was something wrong with me. I did have a cough. And I did go to the emergency room of the hospital in a place called Petaluma. Doctor there treated me and he said, you, you know, you really don't have anything that, that bad. It'll go away. Here's some pills. So that was okay. And so as I was leaving the doctor's office, he said, by the way, you wouldn't know this about me, but I was the physician in residence in the South Tower when it was being built. I mean, that's an amazing coincidence. I go back to our house where I was house sitting and I had a nightmare, a lot of nightmares. My wife said I had them for a year, lots of nightmares. And one of them I remember very, very brightly, brilliantly I remember that Bin Laden had attacked our beach with the Al-Qaeda. So I grabbed two AK-47s. Do you remember the John Wayne movies? You know where he comes out with two pistols? Well, I had two AK-47s and I was going down to the beach and I was going to kill them all. And I did. I did. I killed all the Al-Qaeda and I saved Bin Laden for last. I shot him in the face. And of course, 10 years later, 12 years later, somebody shoots him in the face. Let's see what we have left here. There's some more pictures. You've seen a lot of these street scenes. That was the only, that was in the federal building. That was the only surviving structure. Oh, there was a tree, a pear tree that's, that's survived. It's now on display down there. That's what I could have looked like. Some more firemen grieving. Nighttime. That's the bucket brigade. Do you know what the bucket brigade did? Yeah, you know. What was it? The remains. They wanted to bring down the wallets and purses and if remains, what they could find. Some of the remains were in New Jersey. The rescue dog, there were 110 rescue dogs. They didn't find any bodies. They became disenchanted and, and, and lackluster, lost interest. So what the trainers did was, was make effigies of human beings, bodies, and throw them into the building so the dogs would have something to find. Two weeks later, they sent in another 100 dogs. These are comfort dogs. There's one of, one, of, one of the rescue dogs. This I love, it's one of my favorite shots. I put that in there because I, I love it. It says so much. The flag of the United States of America. They're flying, they put them all over the pile. Now that's the guy. Now imagine walking down the street at night in the gloom and the dark with, for the, with the putrid uh, air and, and stuff like that, running into a guy like this, let me tell you. It's kind of scary. Though then he showed up, this is not the guy, this is just a picture I found and, and, and inter interdicted the, the muggers. Now this is taken from the water. Very few shots were taken from the water in the, in the Hudson River. The Coast Guard put out the call in the afternoon, early afternoon, calling all boats. By maritime law, any boat that hears that has to show up. 140 boats showed up, all sorts of boats. Power boats, speed boats, uh, Yachts, uh, uh, tugboats. I have all the tugboats listed in my, in my book. And guess what? I met one of the tugboat captains who's staying where I'm staying. And he was so tight, he couldn't talk about it. He couldn't talk about it. They ferried off 500,000 people. Each boat had a, a name of where they were going to go so you would know what boat to get on. There were no, no, no fatalities, no accidents, and no harm done to any of those half million people. And there were more than a half million, I'm sure of it. Now this has became the first line of defense, the F-15s, it's all covered in, in, my, in my book, but they were impotent, uh, they couldn't fulfill their mission. So this is, uh, the Coast Guard became our first line of defense in this country. And that's the USNS Comfort thousand bed hospital ship that came up from Norfolk. And I happened to meet the Admiral who commissioned her, this is another coincidence in my life. Uh, just wanted to show examples. They treated 800 and something uh, cases of, of, of uh, toxic inhalation, broken, fractured limbs, and things like that. 
That's the F-15. That's a whole other story. I went up uh, to Northern California and I bought a, a copy, I bought a, a, a model of the F-15 and these are the two pilots. They both have a very interesting play in this, in this role of trying to save our country. And that's the, the USS New York that was uh, commissioned in 2008. And that hull is made of recycled steel. And the Land Rover has recycled material on it and the American flag fly around the world. In the next million years, you'll see it up there. That's a classic photograph of Mr. Bush. I sent Mr. Bush a copy of my letter, of my uh, book, and he wrote me the nicest letter back. I kept it at home. There's his famous bullhorn address. And this is, this is the guy, and this is the bad guy. This is the guy who wanted 10 cities, 10 towers, and three nuclear facilities. He is resting uncomfortably, I hope, in Guantanamo. And how many of you recognize the one on the left, huh? How many people remember that flag at Iwo Jima? So I put that in there just to show the two juxtaposed. Those are lights which are no longer there, and they were replaced by this. And that's the cover of my book. I commissioned an artist to do that. And unusual, like most artists, he did exactly what I asked him to do. I have one other thing for you. Uh, the world shared America's grief. 9-11 is not likely to be dismissed by history, nor should it be forgotten. The memory needs to be kept alive, which is why I'm here and why my book is here. We must unite as a family and say to that bunch of fanatical cowards, stop, go away, you are not welcome here. You will not and cannot destroy our values, our democratic way of life, nor our freedoms. We will resist you and hunt you down until we destroy your will to harm us. And you are eliminated from the face of the earth. For this is America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Now I have one other thing that I want to read to you. Something I found on the internet just about a week ago. And it stirred my imagination and my emotions. The flag does not fly because the wind that blows it. The flag flies because each soldier's left breath blows by it. It's the military, not the politicians, that ensure our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is the military who salute the flag, who serve beneath the flag, and whose coffin is draped by the flag. So with that, I say thank you for being here. Thank you very much. God bless you, and God bless America. But by the policy of the Naval War College, I'm not allowed to sell books up here. So there are some down in the gift shop, and if you want to go down and get a book, uh, they're usually $100, but for the Navy, I'm making them $19.95. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got a $20 bill, be my guest. And remember that when you're buying a book, you're not just buying a book. You're buying a piece of 9-11 and a memory of 9-11 to be kept alive. So again, thank you for coming. If I can answer any questions.